Thank you for joining us today to this talk focused on giving you some easy design tips to help you maximize the performance of your GAN-based designs. GAN transistors, specifically EGAN FETs from efficient power conversion, are very similar in behavior to the aging power MOSFETs and therefore power systems engineers can use their design experience to take advantage of the performance enhancements possible with EGAN transistors. Today, we're gonna to talk about three primary design issues. First, we'll discuss the optimal layout techniques for improving performance. Then we'll review some simple and inexpensive heat seeking techniques to extract even more power out of your GAN designs. And lastly, we'll address the question we get very often since the GAN devices switch so fast. What about EMI? The fast switching speeds of GAN devices magnify the impact of parasitic inductances on performance. That's why we're going to focus on layout techniques and ways to minimize these parasitics. It's not possible to reduce all components of parasitic inductance equally, and therefore we'll address them in an order of importance, starting with common source inductance, and then high frequency power loop inductance, and lastly, gate drive loop inductance. Finally, we'll show an example of an optimal layout that realizes the maximum performance of EGAN FETs. Using a half bridge configuration, let's look at the sources of inductance. There are three major loops to consider. The high frequency power loop formed by the two power switch devices along with the high frequency bus capacitor. The gate loop formed by the gate driver, power device, and high frequency gate drive capacitor and the common source inductance. And it's defined by the part of the loop inductance that's in common to both the gate loop and the power loop. Enhancement mode GAN transistors are available in a wafer level chip scale package with terminals in a LAN grid array pictured on the left or ball grid array format pictured on the right. The layout of the gate and power loops are then separated by having the current flow in orthogonal directions as shown here. By interleaving the drain and source terminals on one side of the device, a number of small loops with opposing currents are generated that will decrease the overall inductance through magnetic field self-cancellation. The maximum allowable gate voltage for EGAN FETs is 6 volts, and that's 1 volt above the recommended 5 volt gate drive voltage. This one volt of headroom requires a relatively accurate gate drive supply, as well as limited inductance between the EGAN FETs and the gate driver, as this inductance can cause a voltage overshoot on the gate. Inductance in the gate loop will directly limit the switching speed of the device, and care should be taken to minimize it to achieve maximum efficiency. The smallest power loop and gate loop inductance can be achieved by taking advantage of an inner PCB layer to form an optimized return path. The decoupling capacitors are placed close to the drain of the high side transistor. PCB vias are used to connect the ground terminal of the capacitors to the low side source by way of the first inner layer. And that's where the dielectric thickness needs to be intentionally kept thin to keep the inductance low. An example of this optimal layout technique is shown here. Now let's see what efficiencies can be achieved in a real world example using this layout. The lower the layout inductance, the more efficiency improves. Going from 1.7 nanohenry power loop inductance down to 0.4 nanohenry inductance, achievable with the optimal layout, increases peak efficiency in this one megahertz buck converter by one full percentage point, or approximately a 10% power loss reduction. Not only does the optimal layout improve the in-circuit performance of EGAN FETs, it also reduces the drain voltage overshoot, which as we'll see in a few minutes, 
positively impacts EMI. Our next topic is thermal management, a very common question we get because our devices are so tiny. In this section, the thermal models for GAN devices in chip scale packages will be reviewed, and then the attachment of a heat sink will be discussed. Next, a simple thermal management solution for an entire GAN based power conversion system will be shown. This figure shows the thermal resistance of some examples of silicon MOSFETs and chip scale GAN transistors. Thermal resistance is shown on the vertical axis in relation to device area given on the horizontal axis. As shown here, the junction to board thermal resistance, illustrated by the circles, follows an inverse trend with the device size. However, if you look on the right, the junction to case thermal resistance illustrated by the squares in the graph is much lower for GAN transistors because of the chip scale package and demonstrates that a chip scale GAN transistor can achieve much lower junction to ambient thermal resistance with an effective heat sink connection on the top side compared to silicon MOSFETs, which are illustrated by the red squares. As with most converter designs, the thermal performance of GAN transistors can be improved by attaching a heat sink, thereby reducing the thermal resistance between the junction ambient air. This cross-sectional diagram for a chip scale GAN transistor shows significant heat can be extracted through the solder bars or solder bumps to the connected copper area and adjacent layers of the PC board. The heat sink and thermal material can be attached directly to the top side of the transistor case as shown here providing a more direct path to remove the heat that avoids the added thermal resistance of PC board vias. Now let's look at the equivalent thermal model for this cross section. When adding a heat sink to the system, we have the junction to case thermal resistance or R theta JC and the junction to board thermal resistance or R theta JB, as well as the board to ambient thermal resistance R theta BA. With the added heat sink, we have a case to heat sink resistance, R theta CS, and heat sink to ambient thermal resistance, or R theta SA. A good heat sink design will have a very low R theta SA. Here's our baseline case of a system with a heat sink like in the prior slide. Here we're taking a four square millimeter die and we're adding a 3.6 watt per meter Kelvin gap filler. We're locating our heat sink 0.3 millimeters above the die with gap filler in between the die and the heat sink. And we get a result of 6.3 degrees C per watt at six watts of dissipation. And from this thermal diagram, you can see that the highest point temperature is 138 degrees centigrade approximately, with the heat spreader set at 100 degrees, or a total rise of 38 degrees C with 6 watts of power. Now, in this case, we've added the 1.5 millimeter times 3 millimeter times 0.7 millimeter shim, which is just like having another component close to the power FET as you would have in a half bridge. In addition, we use the 6 watt per meter Kelvin gap filler, and we have 0.2 millimeter spacing from the top of the device to the heat spreader. And you can see that the maximum temperature rise is 125 degrees C with the heat spreader held at 100 degrees C. By simply using the smaller spacing between the heat sink and the device, and by adding a more efficient thermal compound, along with other components in close proximity, a significant improvement in thermals can be achieved. Now this next topic is a question we get all the time due to the super fast switching speed of GAN devices. What about EMI? So first, 
we're going to discuss the effects of layout on EMI generation and propagation. Then we'll look at the impact of faster rise and fall times. And finally, we'll look at the impact of reverse conduction on EMI. Here we look at the layout as a zero cost adder for EMI mitigation. When designing converters, the layout will inherently have parasitic inductance. In this synchronous buck converter example, we show the effect of the loop inductance on the voltage overshoot of the switch node following a rising edge hard switching transition. The left image with loop inductance of just one nano Henry results in a 70% peak voltage overshoot with ringing. The right image is for a layout that uses the optimal layout approach discussed earlier. It has a loop inductance of just 400 picohenries, and it results in only a 30% peak voltage overshoot with some ringing. The EMI generated is proportional to the square of the voltage overshoot magnitude. The loop inductance will also conduct a current during the ringing period with corresponding EMI generated that is also proportional to the square of the current magnitude. Reducing the power loop inductance by half will reduce the EMI generated by a factor of four. EGAN FETs switch much faster than MOSFETs, and many ask the question on about how this affects EMI. It's important to note that there's fundamentally no change in the EMI generated simply because one device switches faster than another. There's only a shift in the spectral content. This can be shown by example using a buck converter operating at 1 MHz, converting a 48 volt input voltage to 12 volts for two switching transient conditions of 5 nanoseconds and 1 nanosecond, respectively. The graph shows the spectrum of the switch node voltage for both transient conditions, with the rising edge time set at the same as the falling edge time, and this excludes voltage overshoot and ringing. It can be seen on the graph that at 90 MHz, the spectral content is already attenuated by 42 dB. In the 5 nanosecond transient case, the first frequency of note is 200 MHz, or 1 over 5 nanoseconds, and in the 1 nanosecond transient case, the first frequency of note is 1 GHz, or 1 over 1 nanosecond. The rate of decrease in spectral magnitude above these frequencies is 40 dB per decade, which means that filtering requirements are already very low to begin with, making it more important to address voltage overshoot ringing that we discussed earlier. Here we present the often overlooked impact of reverse conduction on EMI using a hard switch buck converter as an example. In a MOSFET, reverse recovery manifests as a shoot through current in the power loop. And as was shown earlier, a current in the power loop leads to voltage overshoot and ringing. The reverse recovery adds to the energy in the power loop and thus adds energy to the EMI noise source that is proportional to the square of the reverse recovery current. This recovery current can be several times higher in magnitude than the inductor current of the buck converter. The left waveform shows the voltage overshoot and ringing for a MOSFET based buck converter with dead times of 5 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds, and 40 nanoseconds respectively. And the EGAN FET equivalent in the right waveform uses the same operating conditions. It can be seen on the right waveform that a change in dead time has no effect on the EGAN FET because it has zero reverse recovery and the overshoot is many times less. In summary, EGAN FETs and ICs are EMI compatible. By adopting simple layout te techniques, one can ensure significant reduction in EMI generation that adds zero cost to the EMI mitigation. The higher switching slew rates only result in a shift in spectral content, but do not increase EMI energy. At higher frequencies, EMI reduction techniques are more effective, ensuring lower cost to implement. 
And finally, EGAN FETs and ICs have zero reverse recovery and thus inherently generate less EMI energy in hard switching converters. Today we reviewed some of the key design tips to maximize the performance of your EGAN FET designs. We detailed an optimal layout technique proven to reduce overshoot and increase efficiency. We showed a simple and inexpensive thermal system to maximize the power you can get out of these tiny EGAN devices. And we demonstrated that by adopting simple layout techniques and taking advantage of inherent feature benefits of EGAN devices, they perform better for EMI than MOSFETs despite the significantly faster switching speeds.